Um, this is a video I'm putting together after a presentation we had uh, on Saturday concerning the, um, the creeds. Um, and I was asked uh, to make sure that this was available for anyone who had not been able to, to watch it live on Saturday morning. So um, this is a session about the creeds of the church. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of you who are watching this video, and I want to thank all the people who attended our live session on Saturday morning. I want to thank the Faith and Fellowship Boys, because they've encouraged me to make this material available to the whole parish, and also to the YouTubers, uh, whose work is featured in this video. Um, this is the structure of the, of the material we're going to be looking at today. Um, fairly short sections, but we need some of them, so we're going to be looking at faith and creed, what credo means, uh, what's the Anglican way that we use, uh, we are known for using for discerning our faith, what's tradition, and what are traditions, and how they uh, reflect in our life at the church. A uh, briefest historical look into the earliest creeds of the church, that's going to be very brief, and <clears throat> finally the conclusions about all this material. Um, of course, that was pertaining to that was pertaining to the live presentation. Uh, so, beginning with faith and creed, um, no text or creed can truly comprehend the whole of one person's faith, let alone uh, communities. And when we say church, let us confess the faith. We do not mean this is all the faith we confess. We mean that we use the words of the creed is the gift that the church has with which to express our common faith with one voice. Uh, in this session especially, we are not discerning what the true contents, what the contents of a true faith should be, but the way in which the creeds of the church came to be and the way they became so important for our lives of faith. Uh, faith is our daily, lifelong faith is something different and richer and far more beautiful and demanding than any creed, no matter its length or precision of its language. Back in 2010, Archbishop Rowan Williams um, had a Q&A session on Lincoln Cathedral in the UK, and he was asked about what true faith was about. True faith is daily courageous trust in who God is and what he's done. I think that would be my bottom line there. True faith, courageous, consistent trust in who God is and what he's done. Trust that the God Jesus speaks of and acts for is the real thing. Now, let's talk about credo. Uh, the term, English term creed comes from downing the Latin credo, I believe, which is the first person singular of credere, believe, and which found its way into the Old English. In the religious sense, a creed is an orderly statement of foundations or tenets of that which is believed, a declaration of faith. In our case, something proper to a Christian community or a group of Christian churches. Um, belief is a verb, and this is something that I want you to bear in mind. And when we look in a dictionary, a definition we may find is belief is something, accept something, the willingness to accept something as true, feel sure of the truth, and to have faith, confidence, and trust. And these are all things implying, involving our, our agency. Um, let's look at the Anglican way, the way the Anglican Church is known for discerning the faith. As Christians pursuing our vocation within the Anglican ethos, we articulate our faith and discern the revelation of God with the aid of the three sources, scriptures, reason, and tradition, the so-called Anglican three-legged stool. Um, these legs are both grounded in our human experience, which is where we are met by God, and they support our discernment of the faith which also happens within our human experience. Uh, the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, uh, we read, uh, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, either by ourselves or in community, in Sunday worship, in Bible studies, or devotional reading. The Scriptures 
helped us to discern the relation of God in the history of Israel, in Jesus and the early church, and to interpret that revelation today. Uh, reason. Reason is that one other leg, uh, systematic evidence-based knowledge in the fields of math, biology, history, geography, you know, the awareness of all of which also enables us to discern God's created order. And the tradition of the church. Um, we could say that the tradition of the church is the collective wisdom of Christian believers throughout history and geography in all times and in all places. Uh, the church Catholic in that definition of St. Vincent of Laurent. Uh, someone uh, in jest, but not without logic, defined tradition as the answers to the problems of being the church for God uh, that we had. Uh, when we talk about tradition, tradition and traditions, um, the term tradition <clears throat> um, comes from the Latin and the French, traditio, the noun from the verb tradere, to transmit, to hand over for safekeeping. And this was originally used in Roman law for referring to legal transfers and inheritance. In church usage, uh, tradition points to the different ways in which the faith of the church is handed over, handed down, transmitted down generations of Christians. The tradition of the church includes, first, the apostolic tradition with a capital T, and second, the different church traditions with a lower T. The different church traditions include those concerning our theology, uh, diaconia or service of the church, the liturgy, uh, governance, and spiritual practices. The apostolic tradition with capital T is the body of teachings given by our Lord to his disciples and handed down to the church universal in the power of the Holy Spirit. It includes, among others, uh, baptism, the Eucharist, the apostolic succession of bishops, as well as the receiving and rehearsing of the creeds of the church. Now, let us look into this briefest historical uh, glance into the earliest creeds of the church. Now, how many creeds are there? Um, first, of course, we find the ones in the Bible. For example, the Shema. In the Jewish religion, uh, the Shema, meaning listen in the imperative, uh, conveys a strict belief in one God. It is both a creed and a hymn of praise. It takes its name from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, uh, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Now, we need to locate ourselves as we speak about the first confessions uh, of the church, of the faith of the church, if we can speak about that, that were taking place in the first century. And just to give a sense of where we are, the eruption of the Mount Vesuvius took place in the year 79, and this is quite distant in our imagination. So in this first century in the church, um, disciples are going from a confession in Jesus as Savior to a more formal statement of their faith. Uh, the words of Jesus in the Great Commission found in Matthew chapter 28 establish this link between bat baptism and discipleship and instruction. There was not then, however, a standard baptismal creed, uh, nor a standard, a standard formula of interrogation. What we could call the creed of Jesus, uh, in the Gospel according to Mark, Jesus updated the Shema, adding from Leviticus 19.8, um, and that little clip, but love your neighbor as yourself. Curiously enough, in Luke 10, uh, it is an expert in the law of Israel, a Pharisee, who advances this notion just before Jesus teaches him the parable of the Good Samaritan. Uh, so some of the statements of the Christian faith we can find in the New Testament, um, these are expressions that uh, can be found in some of the books of the New Testament, which reflect, because the church was writing the books of the New Testament, reflects the way the church was speaking about its faith, and you can see how they become um, more and more evolved and more and more uh, nuanced, to put it that way. And you can stop the video at any time and look at the verse.
viruses and, and so on. Um, the earliest confessions of, of the Christian faith uh, also resulted from both the practice of baptism. They were more concerned with the being useful in teaching and baptizing disciples. So they were sure enough to be memorable for candidates for baptism. And here's the record for Christian baptism from around the year 100, uh, which includes a very early form of a creed, a very, very short one. The following is a true record of a baptism which took place in Rome AD 100. The deacon raised his hand, and Publius Decius stepped through the baptistry door. Standing waist deep in the pool was Marcus Vasca the Woodsler. He was smiling as Publius waded into to the pool beside him. Credus, he asked. Credo, responded Publius. I believe that my salvation comes from Jesus the Christ, who was crucified under Pontius Pilate. With him I died that with him I may have eternal life. Then he felt strong arms supporting him as he let himself fall backward into to the pool. And heard Marcus's voice in his ear, I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus as the cold water closed over him. So as years went by, the text of the successive creeds or confessions of the faith of the church became more concerned with the proper articulation of the Christian faith or the rule of faith and the outcome of the trial conflict, specifically as the church expanded both geographically and to the inside of the local culture and politics and even uh, suffered persecution. Um, here are two ways of looking um, at um, the confession of the faith. Uh, and these both come from the New Testament, but again, they give us uh, a, a sense of the evolution of how the church understood what confessing the faith was about. Uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, in a very early community, which is still being persecuted, um, yeah, Matthew is, is talking about the specificity of the moment of being arrested. What are you going to do with your faith? How are you going to, uh, how can you trust your own ability to confess your faith? Uh, so the assurance is that it will not be you, but the spirit of your father. However, in a later stage of the church, which is reflected, for example, in the first epistle of Peter, now we know that the church is settled and there is more investment in making sure that people have a clear understanding of what the faith they believe sounds like. How can it be explained uh, to others? So it's more a church in mission and not so much a church in resistance as it was uh, during, during the Gospels. So um, the earliest of the church creeds and the ones we're going to be looking at today are these, uh, these five. Um, let us locate ourselves in history again. Some of you have been to Hadrian Wall, but you know it's in the north of England. It's a very, very ancient construction. So this is the time when the Hadrian's Wall was finished. Um, this is around this time in the church, uh, in baptism, uh, it had become customary uh, a, tri a tri triple immersion in water. Uh, if we were to put together the content of the three questions, so every time you were dunked in water, you will be, have a question asked at you, we could produce a very, very small creed already following Trinitarian line. Uh, during baptism, the whole congregation, especially those being baptized, were reminded of the serious moral demands made of all who claimed to be Christ's disciples. And this is something that we experience uh, today um, when we uh, share together um, the baptismal covenant. So, this is uh, the first of the earliest creeds we can think of the rule of faith. Um, when we speak of the rule of faith, and depending on the context, we could be referring to either the first creed that we know of, developed in the second or third centuries, or um, what some churches consider their ultimate doctrinal authority. For example, sola scriptura, or the scripture alone, for some Protestant churches. Uh, some Protestant churches believe that their doctrine is defined and, and limited and, and bound by what's in the scriptures. Uh, they verbum for some for the Roman Catholic churches. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church believes that the faith can be discerned with the scripture and the tradition of the church. And for Anglican churches, we talk about the three-legged stool of scripture, tradition, and reason. But here, when we say uh, the rule of faith, we are referring to the first meaning. So the first creed developed second, third century after Christ. So this is 
the text of this first um, earliest of creeds that we can think about today. And you can see how this goes beyond the three questions that you have asked at baptism and it starts elaborating on some other details of the faith and the story of our salvation in Jesus. And again, you can pause the video anytime when you want to look at the text of these uh, creeds in any detail. Now, uh, if the rule of faith is uh, perhaps the earliest uh, creed we can think of, the Roman, old Roman symbol uh, is another one. Um, this symbol, um, you can see a progression from the rule of faith um, into what was known as a symbol or symbolum, a Greek word which back then referred to a phrase or a word used as a token for the purpose of access, assessing authenticity. So it would be the equivalent if you showed up to a meet with half a card and somebody else show up, showed up with another half card and you will know that the person is to be trusted because they have the symbol, uh, the association with symbol, with something that is signified by something else is more recent. Back then, it was a means for identifying somebody's authenticity. So the use of this word uh, points to offering one half of the statement of faith as a question. Do you believe in God? Which can only be matched with the fitting response. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, and so forth. Often, this is the reason why other creeds are often described this way, for example, the symbol of the Apostles, or the symbol of Nicaea, and so forth. This is the text of the old Roman symbol, and you can see again how some details are more being, being invested upon. Um, as you look at the text, again, again feel free to stop the, the video feed. Uh, this bit at the bottom between brackets, uh, apparently it was added maybe one or two hundred years after the original text. Somebody looked at it two hundred years later and thought, oh my God, is missing anything about the life everlasting. So they added it. All these bits with questions and comments are things belonging, of course, um, to, to the life presentation. So again, let us locate ourselves um, in the third century, which is when the next and the creed we're going to look at uh, came up. So well, around this time, uh, maize as a crop made its way into North America from Mexico. So this is a long time ago. Um, uh, in the third century, in the church, there was an enhancement of the role of a formal creed in the baptismal ceremony and its immediate preliminaries. The new procedure was known as the rendering of the creed, uh, in Latin, the Ditio Symboli, the climax of the catechetical training which preceded baptism. It was then the task of the catechumens, or the people being prepared for baptism, to memorize and eventually to reproduce the creed, normally in the course of the baptismal service. But the Apostles' Creed comes out of a lot of different creedal affirmations of the second century. We don't actually have a smoking gun here. We don't know where it comes from specifically. We do know of a number of these types of baptismal creeds, though, from the time of the second century. Again, up during the times of persecution, after the times of the apostles, before the conversion of Constantine and others. And what would generally happen is whenever one converted, it was a common practice for someone to spend up to a year as what we call a catechumate or someone who is learning the faith that they now profess, learning some of the basics of biblical orthodoxy or faith, all these types of things. And then after a year, you would come to baptism, and it would be asked of you, Christian, what do you believe? And one would rattle off the things that they had learned, often in a formulaic style like a creed. And we know, for example, of one of these types of creeds called the Old Roman Creed which in many ways is something like the backbone to what we today call the Apostles' Creed. But at some point, much later, mind you, 3rd century, 4th century around there, we begin to see people referring to the Apostles' Creed more or less as a unit, more or less as a known entity of the Christian faith. And it's around this time also that some of the myths about it being written by the Apostles themselves are sometimes written down or attributed in the stories. So in other words, the Apostles' Creed is one of these baptismal creeds, one of these basic confessions of faith that many Christians and many churches in the 2nd century would affirm. 
By the third or fourth century, though, by some time later, it becomes, uh, you might say, an idealized example of many of these types of things. The importance of it, though, is that Christians were always a confessing bunch. They were always a creedal bunch, so that when one came to faith, a creed was often the way that one was led through the basics of what all Christians confess. And here's the text of the Apostles' Creed, which we can locate around the year 260. And again, you can see how uh, the, the thinking of the church is going in a very specific direction. Um, somebody asked, um, um, how come Pontius Pilate, who essentially gave Jesus up for death, uh, is present in the Apostles' Creed? Uh, and the rector was pointing out, and this is accurate, that um, uh, it's a way of uh, historically locating the events concerning Jesus. It's also a, a, a way to, to address the people in the Gentile community who were trying to figure out and trying to anchor their faith in their own experience. And this was a way to relate to them with the Roman Empire and the power of the Roman Empire. I think it was also a way to name names, which in reconciliation, as we are learning, uh, can be very and Pontius Pilate represented power, uh, and power uh, misused and abused. Now, as time uh, went on, uh, the church and the language of her creeds were still concerned with the practice of baptism, but gave growing attention to other issues of doctrine, the local culture, and inevitably, also political issues. It is also the time when emperors gain influence in the church and theologians and bishops look to philosophy as aid in the acquisition of the Christian scriptures and doctrines, especially as they were facing uh, heresies uh, in the church. So uh, we looked at the Apostles' Creed um, and now I want to invite you to look at uh, the Nicene Creed. Um, again, let us locate ourselves in history. This is the, the fourth century. Um, Emperor Constantine was making himself a name. Um, this is the end of the age of outside persecution and the beginning of the imperial patronage. It also affected the relations of Christians to one another. One symptom is the development of creeds as tests of orthodoxy. What do you believe and how well do you believe? The emperors after Constantine, accepting the uh, reign of the pagan emperor Julian, saw it as their business to do everything possible to maintain the unity of the church. Now, this is the text of the Nicene Creed, and I have to insist that this is a text which was conceived um, before what we know today as the Nicene Creed, but I will let the, the, the video coming up tell you more about that. But because of its historical boundaries, the Apostles' Creed did not account for all the developments of the Church thinking about Christ or Christology, which came about during the 3rd and 4th centuries with the promulgation of what we know as the Nicene Creed in the year 325. Uh, the Nicene Creed came as a doctrinal solution to the controversy around Arius, a Church minister from the Egyptian Sea of Alexandria who had opposed the teachings of his bishop concerning the doctrine of the Trinity. The Council of Nicaea, sometimes also spelt Nicaea, both are cool, is usually regarded as the first ecumenical council of the church. It happened in 325 AD, and prior to 313, the church was dealing with official persecution from the Roman Empire, and as such, it found it pretty tough to communicate freely. Depicted by the little blue patches on this map, the local churches were small and isolated. Most of these little blue patches were minorities living in hostile pagan territory. Each community was run by a local bishop with significant power to interpret the faith. These little churches were tough, hardcore Christians who seemingly had to battle with an awful lot of lions. In 313, after the Edict of Milan, which legalized Christianity, the church spread rapidly and these isolated communities could communicate again. Hooray! And boo! Too many years alone meant that some communities, like the one in Alexandria, had developed the strange idea that Jesus was the best creature God had ever created, but he wasn't God. 
This heretical belief became known as Arianism, after Arius, the priest who most publicly encouraged it. The Western Church pretty much ignored this teaching, but the Eastern half of the Church was arguing so much that Constantine, who put his whole reputation behind the Christian Church with that Edict of Milan thing, declared enough was enough. He summoned the bishops to Nicaea for a council. 318 bishops turned up. Many were still bearing scars from the persecution that had ended only 12 years prior. They argued a lot and eventually Constantine suggested a reformulation of the belief to clarify it. He also suggested that voting against it would be unwise. 316 bishops agreed and uh, two disagreed. This reformulation was most of what we now call the Nicene Creed. Jesus is light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. The two bishops who voted against it were excommunicated. Unlucky. Now, this is the text of the Nicene Creed. And again, I have to emphasize, this is an earlier version of what we ourselves know as the Nicene Creed, as we will see just in a moment in, in this presentation. But see that this is not the text of the Nicene Creed we're familiar with, uh, beginning from the bottom. I mean, there's this long warning against heretics, and it tells us exactly when this Nicene Creed came to be. What we in church speak about as the Nicene Creed, for brevity's sake, is actually known as the Nicene uh, Constantinopolitan Creed, but it's a very long name, so we shorten it to Nicene Creed, but it can be confusing. But this is the actual Nicene Creed, and you can see that it has some elements that are very common to what we know as the Nicene Creed, but also other elements that are, you know, frankly, nowhere to be found in our own version of it. So, this is when we come to the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, the last in our list of five earliest of the Church Creeds. In our last video on the Council of Nicaea, we discovered that while Constantine and his happy band of bishops succeeded in penning the Nicene Creed, which was a fantastic basis for Christian orthodoxy, they did a fairly rubbish job of actually applying that in their home diocese. As a result, in the next 60 years, Constantine himself switched back to Arianism as a means of keeping the empire together, and the great Saint Jerome complained that the whole world was Arian. Constantine himself died in 337, but his son, who succeeded him, was totally Arian. Athanasius, the champion of the truth, who had the theology right, was booted out of the church multiple times. At the same time, a bishop called Apollinarius from Syria was so unhappy with Arius that he swung too far the other way. He claimed that not only was Jesus fully God, but that he was so godly he wasn't really human. Apollinarius claimed that Jesus was essentially a human body with a divine soul, and not truly human at all. Well, clearly all this fighting was no good, so Pope Damasus asked the new emperor, Theodosius, to call a council. It's interesting that the Pope couldn't call one himself, because he didn't yet have that power. So, they met at Constantinople, the new capital of the Roman Empire. At the Council, both Arianism and Apollinarianism were rejected. It affirmed the Nicene Creed, and slightly reformulated it. They added some nifty stuff about the Holy Spirit, which was another big issue at the time, and they took a kind of negative scolding bit off the end. What was produced is the creed we recite in church every week. It's technically called the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed, but we usually just call it the Nicene Creed, for obvious reasons. Now, here's the text of what we know as the Nicene Creed, but is in fact, uh, the name is, full name is, as you see on the screen. Um, we sometimes, uh, on Sundays, we sometimes recite this creed, and sometimes, for brevity's sake, uh, we use the Apostles' Creed, which, as we saw before, speaks more to our faith of baptism, but this speaks more to the faith of the whole of the life of the Church. And again, you should stop the video at any point if you want to look with more intent, or you can also look into uh, the prayer books uh, for the text of this creed. Now, how many creeds are there? We just saw that there are these five, uh, Rule of Faith, the Old Roman Symbol, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Nicene and Const Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. But 
Uh, there are other creeds, and these are not all of them. There are many, many, many more. Uh, you can go to Wikipedia and search for uh, creeds of the Christian churches or declarations of faith of Christian churches. And there is a long, long, long list uh, in there. Um, the conclusions. Um, on the one hand, the creeds are a rule of faith. They, they help us to identify among ourselves and they help us to converse about our faith. It's a means of not only uh, assessing someone's uh, authenticity, but also of dwelling with each other in, in what we believe. It's a rule of faith that we share and we can welcome each other in it. Uh, they're also offerings to God. So when we recite the faith, we, we, we are, we are, it's a song of love as believers to, 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 to the God in whom we believe. Uh, it's not a, a scientific declaration of our faith. Uh, it's, it's a love declaration of that which we have been gifted with believing. Um, the creeds are also a renewal of baptismal vows, uh, and we do that more intentionally so in our renewal of the baptismal covenant. But every time we recite the creed, whether the Apostles or the Nicene Creed or the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, uh, we are renewing the, 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 the promises which were made by ourselves uh, if we were baptized as, as adults, or the promises which were made on our behalf as children and which we renewed, hopefully in confirmation, or as we participate in the life of the wider church. Uh, the creeds are also a tradition, a, a, a transmission, a passing down of the symbol of this, of, of this, uh, of this word, of this identification of the faith. Um, and the creeds are also participation in the confession of the faith of the church Catholic in all times and in all places. Um, before we get to this reading after Zoom, uh, somebody asked about the text of the creed is sometimes uh, being prefaced with I believe or we believe. Um, um, what happens is that if, if you remember at the very beginning, um, creeds were mostly used for baptismal purposes. So if one person is being baptized, um, um, logic tells us that it should be I believe. But as they were more, as they were changed, transformed into communal declarations of faith, it of course made more sense to say we. This is a matter of semantics. Uh, there is not a, a strong doctrine behind it. We can make any interpretation we want, but it's mostly something that uh, adapts itself to, to the circumstances. Uh, so for reading after Zoom, uh, after this, after watching this video, I will encourage you to consider reading either of these two books by Archbishop Earl Williams. Uh, Tokens of Trust, he specifically addresses uh, the creeds and the way they help us to, to, uh, to articulate our faith uh, in the real world. Um, there are no questions or comments, of course, because this is a video. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for watching with us today. And I hope that you can join us next time when we have one of these study sessions of which you will be uh, properly advised in time. Thank you so much.